Hello and welcome, my wonderful listeners, to episode 70. Today, I'm continuing this series on animal physiology by exploring the world of animal sensoria. Sensoria means all of the different organs and structures that animals use to detect and perceive their surroundings. In episode 52, I talked about plant sensoria, and I explored the unique but limited way in which plants detect their environment and maintain a kind of awareness of their own bodies. Now, plants can't move, so they can't attack prey or run away from predators. There's no real evolutionary pressure for them to evolve animal-like senses. Plants also don't have nervous tissue or consciousness as we understand it. So who knows how a plant perceives what its tissue is telling it? In any case, it seems that the plant sensory experience, when compared to an animal's, is relatively limited. This is because unlike plants, animals have complex nervous systems, and animals can move around. And this gives them exposure to evolutionary pressures that force them to evolve means of detecting, in real time, this changing dynamic landscape all around them. This pressure to develop some kind of awareness of the nearby environment led to the evolution in animals of structures that could detect all manner of inputs from the external world. Think of the animal as like a mobile biological capsule, which swims through the oceans or creeps and crawls along the hard, rugged crust of the planet. The first senses that the animals would have possessed were limited to a rudimentary body awareness, which were traits handed down from their proteal ancestors. The animal has feeling in its tissues, and knows where its body is and how it's oriented in physical space. It can feel basic inputs, like its body heat, its osmolarity, and the ever-present direction of gravity. Furthermore, the animal exists within a matrix of particles, like air or liquid water, and various actions, either by an animal or some aspect of the natural physical environment, will create disturbances in this matrix, and the animal will be able to somehow feel or detect these disturbances. For example, if there's a rock on a mountain and the rock you know, somehow gets shook and loose or something or slips and it starts tumbling down the mountainside, it'll make loud cracking noises. And these cracking noises are literally pressure waves in the air. And as these pressure waves come and get detected by the ears of a mountain goat, the mountain goat's brain is able to perceive this sound input and perceive it as a recognizable sound, as the sound of rocks falling off a mountain. And so the goat will then have its body perform an evasive maneuver so as to avoid being injured by this falling rock. All sorts of sounds have all sorts of triggers. For example, there's mating calls that will entice birds or reptiles or amphibians or whatever's making that mating call to come out of their hiding spot and find the mate to try and reproduce. There's predators that will try and mimic these mating calls to lure their prey out so they can catch them and eat them. And then there's noises that the predator animal makes that it either can't control or that it makes unintentionally, and the prey animals have learned to detect that noise and respond by hiding or running away because they know that that sound is associated with the predator. Similarly, when an animal roams across the open surface of the planet during the day, the sun's light will illuminate the land and the sky, with light waves hitting and reflecting off of everything. The animal's eyes have evolved to detect these light waves, and the animal's nervous system can piece the visual data together into a coherent, real-time image of the external world. I'll go into all of these senses and more in much greater detail, but first, I need to explain the biological operating system that makes the senses work. This operating system, this wetware, is the nervous tissue, which innervates the animal's body and forms dense connections between the sensory receptors and the brain. These neurons are the biochemical highway that enables the flow of sensory information. Now in this episode, I'll just be talking about neurons conducting sensory signals and allowing the animal to sense its environment, to sense its body. I'll talk about the neural system in much more detail in a near future episode. Anyway, this process of a sensory organ sending information to the brain has three basic stages. Transduction, amplification, and transmission. Transduction involves the sensory cells in the sensory organ being excited from a rest position by the appropriate stimulus. 
This is to say that the cells in your eye are activated or excited by light and not by sound, and vice versa for the cells in your ears. This activation has an electrochemical basis. When your neuron is at rest, the inside and the outside of the neuron's plasma membrane has a difference in its charge. They're both negatively charged, but the inside of the neuron membrane is much more negatively charged than the outside of the membrane. These relative negative charges are maintained by the concentration of certain ions inside and outside of the membrane. As all of these ions have a charge, and the mass effect of all of these electrical charges will influence the electrical charge of the proximal surface of the membrane. The difference between the voltage on the inside and the outside of the neural cell is called the membrane potential. So an activating input, like light or sound, will induce a change in the sensory cell's membrane potential. And if this change is strong enough, it can cause a change in the concentration of ions. Sometimes this flow of ions along their concentration gradient will make the inside of the neuron less negative, or closer to being positive, which is called depolarization. And then on the flip side, when the inside of the neuron is made even more negative than it is in the resting state, it's called hyperpolarization. When these charges on the inside and outside of the membrane get depolarized enough, or hyperpolarized enough, as they would when they're stimulated by an input, then they can cause reactions or conformational changes in proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. These proteins are voltage-gated, or voltage-sensitive. These proteins include transport proteins that move ions. And this flow of ions through the transport proteins, or with the help of the transport proteins, can create rapid and controlled disruptions in the membrane potential. If this disruption is strong enough, it will pass a threshold, which means that it's strong enough to generate an action potential. In the action potential, the depolarization effect will spike, which will very briefly create a positive charge on the membrane. This brief positive charge will cause some ion channels to close, and it will cause others to open, and then this will cause a rapid repolarization back to baseline. The repolarization brings the membrane potential back into the negative quite fast, and for a brief moment, it swings over into a hyperpolarized state before recovering to the resting potential. To summarize, this transduction step involves the sensory cell being activated by an input, and this input will alter the membrane potential enough to cause controlled changes in ion concentrations, and this will generate an action potential, which is like a very focused change in the membrane voltage. This action potential travels like an electrical wave, or a pulse, down the length of the neuron, which is what enables amplification. The amplification stage is where the signal is sent to other neurons connected to the sensory neuron, and the signal is literally amplified by being spread out to multiple neurons. Now multiple neurons are carrying the signal. The action potential will travel down the length of the neurons until it comes to the brain, or some spinal ganglia, which then transmits the action potential into meaningful data, or a meaningful response. This is the basic process of transduction, amplification, and transmission. What's really interesting is that no matter what kind of sensory cell created the action potential, and no matter how intense the input is, like a loud sound compared to a quiet sound, or a bright light compared to a dim light, no matter the variable, these action potentials all have the same magnitude and duration. They all appear the same to the brain. The critical details here are the frequency of the action potentials and the very specific region of the brain that receives them. For the brain to determine, for example, that one sound is louder than another, the activated cells in the ear will send a higher frequency of action potentials than they would if they were hearing a quiet sound. The same is true for the rod and the cone cells in the eye that detect brightness and color, respectively. Furthermore, sensory organs have receptors that are specialized for detecting various parts of the total sensory input. This is to say that there aren't just generalized ear neurons that detect all the sounds a human can hear. There are actually specific groups of neurons that only activate for certain pitches, and thus they specialize at detecting those pitches of sound. This is analogous to the specialized neurons in the eye, the rod and the cone cells, which detect different aspects of the incoming light. This is also analogous to the skin, 
which contains a wide variety of different uh, sensory neurons that detect different environmental conditions or inputs like pressure, heat, or pain. It's really important to understand the internal specialization of these neural cells, of these sensory cells. And it's just as important to understand that all of these different types of neural cells, all of these specialized kinds of sensory cells, they all ultimately connect to different regions of the brain. It's these distinct regions in the brain that receive action potentials from specific kinds of specialized sensory cells. And this particular organization, with this uh, high degree of specificity, allows the brain to translate nondescript action potentials back into specific types of input, based on what part of the brain received them. And then it can piece all of this information back together into a coherent, real-time awareness of the surrounding environment, and of what's happening to the animal's body. Okay, so now that I've explained the basics of this neurochemical sensory wetware, it's time to look at each type of sense individually. Throughout the episode so far, I've used the ear as an example, so I'll start with the ear. The ear, in short, is a sensory structure that animals use to detect sound. Specifically, the ear detects changes in air pressure that are created by stuff doing things, anything that makes noise, like a rock falling off of a cliff or a hoofed mammal stepping through a field, or a bird singing a mating song. All of these things, and I'm sure you can think of an infinite number of other things, they all create sounds. And the sounds are the organic perception of these pressure waves vibrating through the air. Because the ear is detecting changes in pressure, the sensory receptor is actually a type of mechanoreceptor, which receives mechanical input as opposed to energy input. In vertebrate organisms, most of these mechanoreceptors take the form of a hair cell, which is a cell that has a cluster of thin columnar projections coming straight out of the top, just like hair. These columnar projections are called stereocilia, and they're all connected by a thin mesh network of actin filaments. The actin filaments are literally like a net that just dangles over all of them and keeps them all uh, standing together. And so when a pressure wave comes through, the pressure wave will push against the stereocilia, and this will cause them to bend in a particular direction. All of the actin filaments are then stretched tightly, and if the stereocilia are bending in the right direction, the tightened filaments of actin will pull open potassium channels in the cell's membrane. This will cause positively charged potassium ions to rush into the hair cell, which will then depolarize the membrane. This depolarization triggers calcium channels to open, and then calcium ions will flow into the hair cell. These calcium ions facilitate the movement and release of neurotransmitters, which then carry the signal from the hair cell to the postsynaptic neuron, and from there, up the chain of neurons to the brain. Humans have hair cells that can detect a limited range of vibrational frequencies. Sound waves that come in at frequencies that are above or below our hearing range, well, we can't hear them. Our cells can't pick them up or get activated by those frequencies. However, other animals can detect slightly different ranges in the frequencies, and this has altered how they behave and how they've evolved. A very basic example is a dog whistle. A human will blow into a dog whistle to make an extremely high-pitched noise with an extremely high frequency. It's too high-pitched for a human ear to detect, and so to us, it sounds silent. But dogs have a hearing range that extends into these higher pitches, and the dog will hear that note as a very high-pitched squeal. Another common example can be found in bats, who repeatedly emit high-pitched noises called ultrasounds, which bounce off of nearby surfaces and create ultrasound echoes, which the bats then detect in their inner ear. Based on the timing and the intensity of the echoes, the bats can figure out the distance and the shape of nearby objects and surfaces, and this gives them a complex awareness of their environment. This echolocation, or this biological sonar, is extremely sophisticated in bats, to the point that they use it as their primary means of navigation. They navigate more accurately with sonar than they do with their eyes, and contrary to popular belief, bats aren't actually blind. Bats have eyes that operate just fine, but their ears are just way better at it because of this echolocation ability, and correspondingly, the part of the bat's brain that processes sound is disproportionately large. 
Conversely, elephants are known to communicate with infrasound. Infrasound frequencies are too low for the human ear to detect, but animals like elephants use these infrasound frequencies to stay in contact over huge distances. The elephants make these super deep infrasound noises with their mouth, and like a very heavy bass note, they can travel extremely far. Elephants that are separated by miles can communicate with each other through infrasound, which they detect not just with their ears, but also with their legs. Their legs are able to sense the vibrations in the ground itself caused by this infrasound. I think this is kind of incredible, because it's like the elephants have this borderline superpower. Elephants can communicate over entire landscapes, in a frequency that few other animals can even hear. So it's kind of like a secret frequency, almost. The mechanoreceptor hair cells that are responsible for all of this sound detection exist in numerous vertebrates. They exist mostly in the ears of land-dwelling vertebrates, but they also exist in fish and amphibians. In these more aquatic animals, uh, they may or may not have ears, but these hair cells also exist in sensory organs that form what's called a lateral line. The lateral line is a linear series of pores, or nodes, that detect vibrations in the water. They allow the fish and the amphibians to detect the pressure waves that are created by organisms in the water as they swim around, or as they thrash around in the grips of a predator. This means that prey fish can detect the movement of nearby predators, and it also means that predatory fish can detect, feel, and follow the vortices in the water that are created by their prey fleeing away in Piscesian terror. The lateral line also allows fish to detect their prey in the absence of light. If a fish is a nocturnal hunter, or if it lives in the deeper parts of the ocean where no light can reach, the fish can't always rely on its vision to detect prey, and so the lateral line provides a sensitivity that more than makes up for the lack of light. In some species of fish, this lateral line has evolved into a kind of electroreceptor organ, which is sensitive to electric fields. As I discussed earlier in the episode, nerves operate on an electrochemical basis. The membrane's voltage is integral to the sending of action potentials. This means that the nervous system is, fundamentally, an electrochemical system, and this means that it emits a weak electric field. Muscle tissue is highly innervated, and so muscle tissue emits these electrical fields as well. Animals with an electroreceptor organ can detect these electric fields, and they can use them to sense and track other animals. It's important to clarify that the animals with this sense are almost always water-dwelling animals, like fish or amphibians. This is because water, like the salt water in the ocean, is a tremendously better conductor than dry air. This conduction quality of the water enables these electric fields to be detected in the first place. For example, sharks have an organ called an ampulla, which is lined with hair cells that are maintained at a certain voltage. When the shark comes into an electric field, the hair cells become exposed, and they depolarize, and they relay this signal to the shark's brain. This allows the shark to more or less smell the electric fields created by the muscles of their prey animals. Other aquatic animals, like the electric eel, have a massive electric organ that can induce a 500 volt change in the electric potential, and pump one amp of current into the nearby water, which will shock and perhaps kill prey that's as large as a grown man. Then you have animals like electrogenic fish, which create arcing currents with the organs in their tails, and things that get caught in the current will disrupt it with their own electric fields, and the fish will thus be able to detect them. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned regulating heat, or sensing heat. Being able to detect the temperature inside and outside of the body is a critically important part of animal life. Various types of thermoreceptors, which detect this heat, they'll depolarize in the presence of heat or because of the lack of heat. If you pick up something that's cold or you touch something that's hot, the specific thermoreceptors will activate and relay this information to your brain. As you are probably aware, thermoreceptors exist in the skin and they help the animal detect the temperature of the ambient air or the water that surrounds it. 
but thermoreceptors also exist within the organism's body, even within the neural tissue of the central nervous system, where these receptors are used to monitor the internal body temperature and respond to temperature changes. Being too hot causes the animal to sweat or pant, or to seek out water to dive into, or mud to cover itself with. Being too cold causes the animal to shiver, or to burrow into the ground, or to huddle together with other animals, to perform some kind of heat-generating or heat-conserving behavior. Now, what's kind of interesting is that if you touch something that's extremely hot or extremely cold, your brain doesn't really get signals from the thermoreceptors. It gets signals from the nociceptors. The intense stimulus will just bypass the thermoreceptors and go straight to the nociceptors, which are pain receptors. They detect pain. If you burn yourself on something extremely hot, or if your tissue freezes because you're somewhere that's extremely cold, or in a more general sense, if the tissue gets damaged from an abrasion or a puncture or a laceration, then the nociceptors in your tissue will generate the appropriate sensations of pain. Now, you might wonder why on earth the animal body would evolve receptors to detect pain. Because being in pain is awful. It's an aversive state that an animal doesn't want to be in. But being able to detect pain is actually really important because this pain detection is a huge behavioral modifier. It encourages the animal to not engage in dangerous behavior, to avoid dangerous things. Because pain is a deterrent. The animal doesn't want to be in pain. Pain is also a way to detect if something in the body is going wrong, or if something like a bone is broken, and the animal can then compensate or alter its behavior by not inflaming the painful area by not putting pressure on it or using it to hit stuff so that it can minimize risk of infection and further damage, and it can help the, the injury heal. Every now and then you'll hear about a case in the news where a human child is born with the inability to perceive pain. They don't know what pain feels like. And you might think, wow, that must be super cool, you know? I'd go around and fight bad guys, and it'd be great, you know, wouldn't feel pain. Except there's a huge problem, because as these kids grow up, they just play around and do kid stuff, but they can't feel if they get a cut. They can't feel if they break a bone. And so this means that they're actually more at risk of having injuries that go undiagnosed. They're more at risk of having wounds that don't get treated because they just don't notice them, and so they might get infected. And th this puts them at risk of a whole lot of things. And so the inability to detect pain can be problematic and potentially dangerous. One of the most important senses, at least it is for humans, is vision. Vision is photoreception, or the detection of light waves with a structure called an eye. Now, much like the sense of hearing, the sense of vision varies wildly across species. For example, you have apex raptors, like falcons and eagles, that have incredibly good eyesight. They need to have extremely sharp clarity in their vision, so that they can detect the movement of prey animals on the ground, like rodents, while they're up in the air, flying really high off the ground. Then you have fish that live deep in the ocean, or animals that are nocturnal hunters. And these have very sensitive eyes that have very great night vision, or vision in low-light conditions. Then you have animals, like those that dwell in caves, that may have evolved to be blind. Because having vision is useless in a pitch-black cave, and so it's a total waste of resources to grow and maintain eyes. I mean, even the caloric demands on the brain for processing visual information it's really intense, and so if you don't have any meaningful visual information for your brain to, to use, you're just kind of processing all this blackness, and it's a pointless waste of nutrients. It's a waste of chemical energy and resources. Then you have animals like insects, which have compound eyes. They're called compound eyes because their eyes appear to be composed of hundreds or thousands of smaller little eyes. When you look closely at an insect's eye, it looks like a bubble that's covered in scales, or dots, or smaller bubbles. These scales, or dots, or smaller bubbles, are the lens of a column-shaped structure called an omatidia. Insect eyes are packed with hundreds or thousands of these omatidia things, and each one works kind of like a pixel in a computer screen. The lens in each omatidia focuses a small portion of the visual field onto a small handful of receptor cells, 
and when thousands of omatidia are operating together, they create a pixelated visual perception of the outside world. The visual resolution increases directly with the number of omatidia, just like the resolution on your computer screen increases directly with the number of pixels. The eye structure of a vertebrate animal is larger and both more and less complex from certain points of view. Where the insect eye has many hundreds of lenses, the vertebrate eye only has one lens. But this one lens and the single mass of associated receptor cells forms a much larger, much more complex overall structure. The compound eye also evolved only once in an arthropod ancestor, but the vertebrate eye, also called a simple eye because of its one lens, has been evolved multiple times. This simple eye has various forms, depending on the animal species you're looking at, but it works on the same general principle. The eye is a hollow, fluid-filled sphere that lets light in through a pinhole at the front, where it goes through a lens which projects and focuses the light along light-detecting cells along the back layer of the eye, called the retina. The light first goes through a transparent layer called the cornea, and then through the iris and the pupil, and then it goes into the lens. The lens focuses the incoming light so that it projects sharply along the retina. And this allows the image to be perceived as clear and crisp and in focus. The retina that receives this focused light possesses various light-detecting cells called rods and cones, which are embedded in a darkly pigmented layer of epithelial tissue. It's somewhat similar to a bunch of people sitting in a dark movie theater watching a movie. Now, rods and cones detect light in different ways. Cones detect color, but they aren't very good at detecting brightness. Rods are not particularly sensitive to color, but they're great at picking up dim light and detecting brightness. There's a particular spot on the retina that's only covered in cone cells. This area is called the fovea, and when you focus on an object, when you stare intently at it, the light is being focused onto your fovea. This maximizes its resolution, uh, and thus the detail and the colors that you can visually perceive. On a cellular level, the rods and the cones possess a protein complex called rhodopsin, which is composed of both an opsin protein and a retinal pigment. Each rod and each cone has many thousands and thousands of these rhodopsin molecules to maximize their ability to detect light. When a photon strikes and gets absorbed by a molecule of retinol, the 11th carbon atom in the retinol molecule will change the conformation, and this makes the retinol close ion channels that feed to the nerve cells. So unlike hair cells, the rods and cones initiate a series of reactions that create action potentials by decreasing the amount of neurotransmitter they send to the neurons. Hair cells generate action potentials by increasing the amount of neurotransmitter they send to the neural cells. So while the retinal molecule is what actually reacts to the light, the opposite molecules control what wavelengths of light they react to. Different kinds of opsin molecules make cones sensitive to different wavelengths of light, just like various hair cells are more or less sensitive to different pitches or different frequencies of sound. Animals have evolved various types of opsins to optimize their fitness in their particular environment. For example, fruit-eating primates have opsins that are sensitive to wavelengths of light around 550 nanometers, which gives them a good capacity to distinguish between ripe and unripe food. Some animals, like birds and insects, can detect ultraviolet light. Seeing ultraviolet light allows pollinating insects to detect certain flowers, and it allows birds to detect certain patterns in their plumage that aren't visible to the human eye. Technically, the human eye actually can detect ultraviolet light. We can perceive it, but we have pigments that get in the way. And so if those pigments are removed, if they're destroyed, then we actually can detect ultraviolet light. But this isn't really a natural human ability because it requires surgical interference. Anyway, when the opsin lets in light and the retinol changes conformation in response to the light, the decreasing amount of released neurotransmitter causes a depolarization in the neural cell that's immediately attached to the rod or the cone cell. This first neural cell is called a bipolar cell, and it transmits the information from the sensor, from the rod or the cone, to a ganglion cell, which is right behind it. And this, this ganglion cell is a nerve cell that has a very long axon. 
All of these axons from all of these ganglion cells coming off of all of the cones and rods are all bundled up together into what forms the optic nerve. The optic nerve flows deep into the skull, immediately under the cerebrum and above the cerebellum, to the optic cortex region at the back of the brain. In my opinion, some of the most interesting senses are the chemosenses, or the chemoreceptors that allow the sensing of various chemicals. Chemoreceptors are able to detect particular types of molecules, which then give the sensing organism some clues about what it is that they're tasting or smelling. The sense of taste and the sense of smell are both chemosenses, and both of them are extremely basal and vital to an animal's survival. The sense of smell is used to detect chemicals in the air, which gives the animal a degree of awareness of what's in its surroundings, like the delicious scent of food, the stimulating pheromones of a potential mate, or the stench of a dead body. Smell, or olfaction, is based on the detection of chemicals called odorants, which are just any airborne chemicals given off by stuff that can be smelled. Inside the nose, there's a membrane that's covered in a layer of mucus. These odorants can come into contact with the mucus, and they'll diffuse into it where they'll bind to membrane proteins of neurons. These neurons send their action potentials up their axons to a structure in the brain called an olfactory bulb. Because there's a huge range of odorant chemicals, there's also a huge range of receptor proteins that are used to detect various types and classes of these odorants. However, individual olfactory neurons only express one type of receptor, and all the neurons with a specific type of receptor feed their data into specialized nodes of neural tissue that exist inside of the olfactory bulb called glomeruli. So the olfactory bulb is packed with these little glomeruli nodes, each one specialized for detecting and processing certain types of scents, certain types of odorant chemicals. The expression of these receptor proteins, and thus the sensitivity of the animal's nose, varies from species to species. Wolves and moths, for example, have hugely sensitive olfactory senses with thousands of different kinds of receptors and millions of olfactory neurons. Humans, in contrast, have a relatively poor sense of smell. We have a relatively small number of olfactory neurons, and about half of the genes that we have for these olfactory protein receptors have been mutated into a state of non-functionality. There's a specific type of odorant called pheromones, which are chemicals that are released by one sex to attract a member of the opposite sex, to influence their behavior so as to attract them and initiate mating. These pheromones are detected by the vomeronasal organ, which is a similar organ, but separate from the olfactory bulb. This vomeronasal organ exists in many animals, from insects to reptiles, and it's a powerful aspect of animal mating behavior. The other major chemoreceptor is the tongue, which detects the quality of food through the sense of taste, also called gustation. The receptors on the tongue are called taste buds, which possess about 100 sensory cells with taste receptors. The tastes that we perceive on our tongue when we eat food are a result of the chemicals in the food interacting with these sensory cells on the tongue. For example, the sensation of a sour taste is caused by acidic waves of hydrogen ions flowing into the cells and depolarizing their membranes. The more acidic the food, the more sour the taste. Now the taste of salt is generated in a similar fashion, except instead of protons, it's sodium ions flooding into the cell and depolarizing the membrane. The sensation of an umami flavor, or a protein flavor, is generated when amino acids like glutamate bind to a pair of receptors on the taste cell membranes. The sensation of a sweet taste, or a sugary taste, is also generated when sugar molecules bind to a pair of receptors. One type of receptor can bind to numerous different types of sugars, which is why different kinds of sugars all taste comparably sweet. In contrast, for the sensation of bitterness, there's a very large family of receptors that binds to a huge variety of compounds. And this actually serves an evolutionary purpose. Stuff that's poisonous, or toxic, or inedible would often taste bitter. Animals evolved a wide-ranging sensitivity to bitterness because it was literally life-saving. If you bit into something and you taste the bitterness of a dangerous poison, it will make you stop and spit it out. 
and if you're an animal out in the wild, this will potentially keep you from eating poison and dying. Recall how earlier in the episode I talked briefly about electric fields and electroreceptors. Well, the electric force is one and the same with the magnetic force, comprising the electromagnetic force, which is one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, alongside gravity and the strong and weak nuclear forces. The cool twist is that, unlike an electric field, a magnetic field can be detected easily in the air. Animals that can detect these magnetic fields are actually surprisingly common, despite the seemingly exotic nature of this ability to detect magnetic fields. Many vertebrate and invertebrate animals are known to be able to detect the Earth's magnetic fields, but this is also an ability that's found in fungi and organisms as simple as bacteria. Scientists aren't entirely sure how the magnetoreceptor system works, but they think that it might involve iron deposits or iron particles suspended in a type of sensory cell reacting to the magnetic field. These iron particles would presumably align themselves in accordance with the current of the magnetic field, and the animal can somehow sense this alignment and use it to become aware of its direction relative to the Earth's magnetic poles. This magnetic sense is used most commonly in birds as a means for navigation, which really helps them on their transcontinental migrations. However, in birds, this sense is used in combination with vision. If the birds have their left eye covered, they can still navigate with the magnetic field. But strangely, if their right eye is covered, they can't. This is really weird, and we still haven't figured out exactly why this is. But what this does make clear is that, in animals as they are in humans, senses are used together. As I explained at the beginning of the episode, an animal uses and combines all of its senses to create a coherent sense of awareness, and it uses all of these senses at once, or a combination of senses at once, to perform various behaviors, like responding to a heat stimulus by pulling their limb back, or by sending out mating calls to try and attract a mate, or by detecting and evading a predator, or by detecting and chasing prey. To summarize the episode, the sensoria feeds physical and environmental input into the biological organism, which translates these inputs into electrochemical signals that get sent to its brain, where they then get organized and translated into an understandable, real-time perception of the world. The sensoria are the animal's tools to experience the world outside of its body, beyond the limits of its flesh, to become aware of the world around it in a very visceral sense. You are an animal, and you have an awareness that is composed of your abstract thoughts and emotions, inseparably integrated with the things you perceive, with your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, and your skin. These are your sensoria, and they allow you to navigate your body along the surface of this world, and experience its vibrations, and its energy, and its chemicals in the most personal, visceral sense imaginable. That is about it for Animal Sensoria. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, uh, why not consider giving it a like, or sharing it with a friend who might also really enjoy it. If you're really digging this series on animal physiology, then be sure to stay tuned and come back next week, when I'll be exploring the biology of animal reproduction. It's going to be a very informative and mind-blowing episode, so be sure to come by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.